I don't know how many of you, I would assume many of you have seen the bumper sticker that says uh, coexist on the back of a car. And, it's, and the coexist is made of different symbols, some religious, I assume, some not religious, but made of different religious symbols there. And I don't know exactly what the meaning is. Who knows what the original maker of that symbol really wanted to convey. I mean, you have a pretty good opinion, though. But some people probably take that as, hey, let's all get together and not kill each other. Well, that's a pretty good meaning, isn't it? We don't, we don't need to kill each other over these things. Okay, that's good. But I would say many probably take that bumper sticker that coexists to mean something like this. Hey, let's all coexist. We're all going to the same place after all. All religions are the same. We're all on the way to heaven. We all know God or our version of God, everything is going to be okay. I would assume that many people take that bumper sticker to mean that. If you look at that bumper sticker, one thing you'll see is the sea is like the half crescent moon of Islam. Islam says that Jesus is not, emphatically says that Jesus is not the Son of God. It does say that He's a prophet, but it does not say He is the prophet. Muhammad is the prophet of Islam. If you look on down in, in that symbol, that coexist bumper sticker, you'll see the Star of David representing the Jewish people. Of course, the Jewish people do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They do not believe He's even a prophet. They don't believe He died for the sins of the world. And then when you get down to the end of that coexist bumper sticker, of course, you have the T or the cross that represents Christians. Christians who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Christians who believe that He is the only way to God, that not only is He the Savior of the world, He's God in the flesh. And what you see very quickly is if the meaning of that bumper sticker is, hey, let's all just agree to disagree. We're all on our way to heaven anyway. What we see is this. There's some big contradictions going on. And I think in the church, this is how many people in the church view the gospel of Jesus. They view it like a coexist bumper sticker. Uh, they say, you know what, we all believe in the gospel. Yeah, we believe different things about the gospel. But you know what, this group has faith in Christ. But I know this group, this, uh, this church or whatever, they say, yes, you've got to believe in Jesus and you also have to be part of, of us. And if you're not part of us, you can't be saved. But they still believe in Jesus after all, you know. Or they say things like this. They say, yes, this group believes in Jesus. And I know they also teach that it doesn't matter how you live. You just lose your reward at the end of the day. But you can live in sin all day. You can live how you want to and still be a Christian. You have this other group. They, and, we say, and they say, you know what? Yes, they believe different than we do. But they believe in Jesus. Though they say that you can't really be a Christian until you're baptized. And baptism is the end of the process of being a Christian. And no, if, unless you've been baptized with a certain formula, you're not a Christian yet. But they still have faith in Jesus. Or you have groups that believe this. Oh yes, this group, they have faith in Jesus. But they also say if you eat pork, you can't be a Christian. Well, they believe in Jesus, though. And what, and what many people in the church do, basically, they look at these different groups, they say, you know what, they believe in Jesus, you know? That's what the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses say. They say, you know what, we're Christian just like you. Why? Because we really believe in Jesus, too. And different people in the church, in churches today in America, they look at the different Gospels just like a coexist bumper sticker. Hey, we all believe in Jesus. It may be your version of Jesus, not my version of Jesus, but we're all going the same way. And here is one thing that we're seeing in Galatians and one thing that we'll see today is that God does not command us on the gospel to agree to disagree. God commands us to agree. Now, to be clear, we're not talking about secondary issues so we're not talking about having all these divisions in the church over things that aren't gospel issues, friends. We're talking about when different preachers, different churches, different bodies of so-called believers, when they, not, not that they disagree with us on important secondary issues, but they disagree with us on the gospel. God says you can't disagree in the gospel and be Christians. Here's what's happening in Galatians. We're going to be in chapter 2. 
today. In the book of Galatians, like I said last week, the Apostle Paul is on a rescue mission. He's preached the gospel to these Christians, and maybe roughly a year later after these churches accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe a year later, false teaching has come in and they're turning away from the real gospel, the Bible says. They're turning away from the gospel that Paul preached, the gospel that Paul received from God. That's what we looked at last week. That not only is this just simply what Paul is preaching, the Bible says this is the message that God Himself gave to the Apostle Paul. You saw in his early, before he was converted, this man is not some huckster, huckster trying to take advantage of people. He's not trying to be a TV evangelist and get your money. This man knew about Christianity and he hated Christianity. The reason this man is saved is because God came to him and changed him, regenerated him, gave him life. This man is not just simply a preacher like me and other people, though most certainly it's a high calling from God. This man is an apostle and God called him as an apostle and taught him personally. And then afterwards, at the end of chapter 1, he's talking about the fact that, hey, I didn't get this gospel from man. I got this from God. I didn't go to Jerusalem and learn from Peter. I met him for about 15 days, but I didn't go to seminary under Peter. I learned this from God. You all have got to listen to me is what Paul is saying here. And that's the authority that every part of the Bible comes to us. Now, it's 2021. We're Americans. We don't like that, do we? We don't like authority. We don't like people saying, this is the only way. God says to us, this is the only way. Again, we're not talking about secondary issues. We're not talking about other issues that are even less than secondary, we may say. We're talking about the gospel itself. The gospel itself. There's a lot of, hey, there's a lot of division in the church today. Most of it is over things we ought not to divide on. The smallest amount of division is over things that really matter, like the gospel. Well, I'll talk more, I think, about that later today. So here is what we're going to see today. You, you may have thought last week when you heard me preach about God revealing the gospel to Paul and Paul coming to the Galatians and saying to him, Hey, you got to listen to me. God gave me this message. You gotta listen. The thought may have come to your mind last week. You may say, well, you know what? There's all kinds of people claiming that though today. I mean, we got somebody down the road, somebody in the next state, somebody on television. I just happened to run across them. Somebody on the internet. I see these ads all the time on my phone. Everybody's claiming to speak for God. Everybody's claiming. That's how false religion starts. So how can I believe that Paul is actually preaching the truth? Paul's a genius, but more than that, he's inspired by the Spirit. And the next thing he says in chapter 2 is this. Not only, not only, Galatians, has God personally taught me and given me this message, but I ended up going up to Jerusalem. And every apostle agreed with what I'm preaching. And for you to disagree with me is not only to disagree with me, it's to disagree with the apostles, it's to disagree with Jesus, it's to disagree with the Old Testament, it's to disagree with God Himself, because everyone who's a true Christian and an apostle here in chapter 2 agrees with what I am saying. Here's what we're going to look at today, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is agreed upon. It's agreed upon. So let's jump in here. Just, just the first two verses, just kind of get the sense of what's happening here. He says in verse 1, Then after an interval of 14 years that may be added to the three years of chapter 1, or probably, I would guess, more likely, that includes the three years of chapter 1. 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Titus is very important here. You're going to see why in just a minute. Verse 2, it was because of a revelation that I went up. Paul went up because God told him to. He, Paul receives revelations from God. He's an apostle. God, for, for however it, it worked out, God told him, God led him to go up to Jerusalem. 
Here is the Apostle Paul. He's been preaching on his own for at least 14 years. He's separated from the Apostles. He's seen many, many people come to salvation. And now God says, go up to Jerusalem. It was because of a revelation that I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Now, if you just read that, it seems like Paul is saying, hey, I'm not for sure if what I'm preaching is right. I don't think that's what he's saying here. I think what Paul is saying is this. Paul is either saying, I want to go up before the apostles. I want to present my gospel before them because I don't want my ministry to be in vain in the sense that I don't want all these people over here and all these people over here saying, you disagree with the apostles and hinder my ministry. So I'm going up to hear from them if they agree with me. So that stumbling block can be removed out of the way of these people I'm trying to win for Christ. Or Paul may be saying this in verse 2. He may be saying, I'm going up to Jerusalem. God led me to go up to Jerusalem so I can help the other apostles know that I'm not running in vain. I want to help their fears they have about me. Regardless, this, Paul's went up to Jerusalem. He's been preaching now for at least 14 years. God has blessed him. Many Gentiles, non-Jews are being saved. He's going up to Jerusalem. He presents his gospel to the apostles. And I want you to see here that when he goes up to the apostles, that they all agree on what salvation is. Paul is not some lone wolf running around preaching heresy, preaching false doctrine. Paul is preaching exactly, exactly what the apostles preached. Look in verse 3. But not even Titus, who was with me, Though he was a Greek. Now here's here's why Titus is so important. Titus comes with Paul. Titus is not a Jew. Therefore, he's not been circumcised. Titus is a Greek. He's a Christian though. He's believed the gospel. It's It's one of the very things the churches of Galatia are struggling with. That's one reason Paul is telling them this, recounting this story to them. He's saying to them, I brought Titus, a person that's like you, who's not a Jew, he hadn't been circumcised, he was a Christian. Look what he says in verse 3. But not even Titus who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. What's he say there? He says, when I got to Jerusalem, we talked about the gospel, we talked about salvation, and none of the apostles thought that he ought to be circumcised. Everybody thought he was already a Christian. They agreed on salvation. Now look in verse 4 and 5. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in. Who's causing the problems here? It's not the apostles. The people causing the problems are not those who've been commissioned by God. The people who are causing the problems for the Galatian Christians and the people causing the problems in this story that Paul is saying are the false brothers. You see, one reason the gospel is so important to us is the gospel is how we tell the false from the true in Christianity. He says, But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. Here's one thing I'd say to you today about this agreement on salvation in the gospel. This is the very first thing that people ought to look into when they look into a church or a preacher or a pastor. This is the very first thing that people ought to look into. What do most people look for in a church? You know, don't you? They look for great facilities. What kind of facilities do you have? Are they clean? Are they safe? Those things are important. But that's normally the first thing people look for. How would you like to be a Christian in Afghanistan looking for a church building that's got great facilities and uh, clean and safe right now? I think you'd be out of luck. Most people in our area, most people in America, 
First thing they look for, what kind of church building do they have? What's their location? Are, are they located within 30 seconds of my house or two minutes of my house? Because you know I don't want to go very far at all because I, I want to be right here. And there is something about in your own community. There is something about that. These things that I'm mentioning aren't necessarily bad. They're not first place though. Most people when they're looking for a church, they look at the children's ministry. What kind of children's ministry do you have? They look at, do I feel at home in this church? They look at, what is the singing like? Do they sing my favorite songs? Or they sing songs I've never heard of? What, what, what's this church doing? They look at, is this church financially well? Are we going to be able to have all the extra stuff that we want in a church building? We're very much consumers in America, aren't we? They look at church buildings. They say, you know what, is my family attending this church building? Because you know, I want to be with my family. And they begin to look at these things. These things aren't wrong, are they? But how rare is it for people to say, does this church preach and teach the gospel? The message that will save my soul. The message that will save my children's soul. Is this church at least talking about church discipline? So when after I'm dead and my, chi- my child and grandchild stray from the Lord, I know that church is not going to let them do that. They're going to go talk to them. What It's one of the most rare things in the world to find people leaving churches. Not because they're leaving churches. Everybody does that. But to leave churches for a good reason because this church is not preaching the gospel. It's a very rare thing. When we, when people think about the church, when people think about which church to attend, where to go, what's important in the church, the number one thing is if the gospel's preached there. Because that is how you tell the false from the true believers, is if they believe and preach the gospel. What do most people look at in a preacher? If he's got a big smile, that's what they look at, isn't it? How wide is his teeth? How big is that smile? That's what, now that's, I'm saying that funny, but there's some truth in that. People look at churches. Well, what's, what's the preacher? Uh, does he have a big smile? Does he have a good personality? Is he young, married, and have kids? Um, they, they, what's his wife like? What's his kids like? Listen, those questions. By the way, churches that are looking for pastors, one of the main things they need to look at is the wife and the children. That's a huge thing, and it's often neglected. Does he have a degree? What kind of education does he have, the church looks at? Does he wear a suit? Does he wear a t-shirt? Does he wear dress shoes? Does he wear tennis shoes? What's he wear when he preaches? Is he dynamic in the pulpit? Is he funny? Does he tell jokes? Does he start off by telling a joke every Sunday to make everybody feel at ease? To make everybody feel like everything's going to be okay. Does he start out like that? Is he nice? But isn't the number one thing about a preacher or a pastor what he actually preaches? And the way he actually lives? The doctrine. His view of the Bible. Does he believe all the Bible's God's Word? Or just does he believe there's mistakes in God's Word? What about repentance? Does he preach repentance? Or does he say you can just believe and, and get on with your life? As long as you got that, that shot, as long as you got that, sal- that salvation tattoo, everything's going to be okay. Or does he preach that a, the Christian life is a life of repentance, a life of faith, and it must continue to the end of our life if we're going to be saved? What's his, what's his view of assurance of salvation? Well, you've been baptized, therefore you know you're saved. Come on now, it's the devil bothering you. Or does he believe the Bible speaks about these things? And we can know we're saved based on the Bible. What's his view of ministry? Does he believe anything goes? Or does he believe the Bible has to guide in everything that the church does? And on and on and on. So when we view what Paul is saying here, he's saying when he got to Jerusalem... All the apostles agreed with what he was saying, and he agreed with the apostles. There's agreement, and this agreement is how you tell the true from the false. It's how you tell a church, a living church, from a brick building. It's how you tell a preacher who has, by the grace of God, the Spirit of God within him, preaching the truth, from somebody who's a smooth talker. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now look down in verse 5 here. 
They agree. They agree on salvation. They also agree on, uh, on these false brethren. They view these people, it appears, as false brothers. He mentions that in verse 4. Now in verse 5. But we did not yield in subjection to them, to the false teachers, for even an hour. What, what that means is not for a moment do we give in to these, these heretics. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. It's been, you know, I'll just guess a year since they believed the gospel and now they're turning away from it. Maybe less than a year. Maybe a little more than a year. What Paul is saying here is when I came to Jerusalem, however long it was, when I came to Jerusalem, we were at a crossroads right there. Will we continue to preach Jesus' message of salvation or will we turn away from it and lose the truth of the gospel? He said we were at a crossroads. What was going to happen here? We're at a crossroads today, aren't we? The reality is every generation gets to a crossroad when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think about the great Reformation time. The Reformation was a rediscovery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't completely lost. The gospel's never completely lost. It was a rediscovery, though, of the gospel. Something that we must know. What was in the news recently today, or this last week? I didn't read the story, but at least the headline. That's, that's a dangerous way to talk about things, but I heard it from other people too, so I guess it's true. The headline said that Harvard has an um, atheist chaplain there now. Did you all see that? I don't know the details. An atheist chaplain. How does that happen? When Harvard began as a, as a gospel preaching institution to, to train ministers, godly ministers, how does that happen? Now, that's happened over the years. Now, it's, it's not just happening. That false teaching is coming in. But these things happen over time, don't they? Many, I don't know, maybe all, but many of the so-called Ivy League schools that we look so much on that have such a terrible view of Jesus, many of these schools started to train ministers in the gospel ministry. That's how they started. You think about the church at Ephesus. That This is a study on its own. Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul preaches to the church at Ephesus. The Apostle Paul is with them for some time. He's there, if you read, I believe it goes into chapter 20, he's there with the church of Ephesus. He meets with the elders and he, and he's there and he's praying before he leaves. The church of Ephesus had apostolic teaching. Not only do they have the Apostle Paul right there with them, the church of Ephesus had the Apostle Paul write an inspired letter to them that they can read and understand the gospel. Not only that, but later, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy will tell Timothy to remain at Ephesus so you can teach men not to teach strange things. This is a church that over and over has the apostles, has the associates of the apostles. They're teaching, they're helping these precious believers in Christ. And what do you have in the book of Revelation? Is one of the letters written to the church of Ephesus says you've left your first love. How can a church started by, how can a church influence and the apostle preached and wrote to him and Timothy was there, Paul's, if we want to say assistant, Paul's, Paul's Timothy, his son, the faith, he was there, he was with the church, he was helping them. How do you wind up saying you've left your, you've, you've left your first love in Revelation? It's because the church is never done. I mean, the, the, the work is never done until it's over. We have to continue in these things. Um, We have to continue. That's one reason we need to be encouraged because there's dangers on every side. You see, these people over here, they're out of the way. They're way over here. The people on the other hand, though, they're way out of the way on this side. The Christian tries to walk in the middle and he can fall off on either side. We're in dangerous territory, but it's glorious. It's glorious territory. How many today? This is unfortunate. You see this in families, though, don't you? How many godly grandparents do we have in America who love God? 
They love the Lord. They love their Bibles. Their children or great-grandchildren or grandchildren or great-grandchildren. They're not Christians and they're not interested. It's a sad thing, isn't it? You see this, this contending for the gospel truth. You see this in church, church buildings. You see these big church buildings at time, no doubt they were thriving churches preaching the gospel. And now you can just tell on their sign or their, or their statement on their website, these churches aren't preaching anything anymore. And yet their buildings are there still. Paul says in verse 5, but we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. There's men and women who have labored and given their life so that we can have the gospel today. There's men who have given their life literally and spilt their blood so we can have the Bible in our language, so we can have the gospel in our hearts. We have to contend for this faith. Let me say a word about this. We're talking about agreement this morning. We're talking about how the early church was agreed. But someone may say, but there's so much, there's so much false teaching though. How do you know they're agreed? Well, let me just turn to 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible actually says there must be division in the church. Did you know that? Now, we don't want division. We don't want we don't want unnecessary division. If there's any division, we want it to be quote-unquote good division. And we know, don't we, there's way too much division in churches today when it ought not be like that. We know that. But what this is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11 is the Bible says that there actually must be, if we want to call it this, good division in churches. Why? Well, look in verse... Let's, let's read verse 18 and 19. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Now again, this isn't talking about some little something that shouldn't be anything. This is talking about real division over real issues. The Bible actually says... There needs to be division sometimes. Why? So you can tell the true Christian from the false Christian. you got false teachers in the church. Let me tell you something. If, if I knew in this church, and I don't know, if I knew there was people who were actually teaching against the Bible, they were purposely going out of their way, they were, they were maybe a, a teacher, and maybe they were say, teaching on Wednesday night, whatever, and they're teaching an anti-gospel, and they will not stop an anti-gospel, then there must be division. If this church is going to be a biblical church. Because that's what the Bible says. We must have a pure gospel here. And then I want you to see this. Starting in verse 6, back in Galatians 2. It's not only did the apostles, Paul and all the apostles agree on salvation, but they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. If you want to say it this way, they agreed on Paul. Let's start in verse 6. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who, have repu who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. Paul says there, he says, listen, I knew the gospel already. They didn't help me in that. Now, he's not being arrogant. When, when we read of statements like this in the Bible or when preachers make statements similar to this in some way, we should not think they're arrogant statements. Paul's confidence is not in himself. Paul's confidence is in God's Word and God's truth. That's why he's bold here. Verse 7, But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted. They say, Paul, we see that you're entrusted with God's Gospel. Been entrusted with the Gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who effectually worked in Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. They say, Paul, we see God's entrusted this gospel to you. We see that Paul has worked in your heart. Verse 9, And recognizing the grace 
that have been given to me, James and Cephas and John, Cephas, another name for Peter there, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They even had agreement over how to use money. Verse 10, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. So when you think about the gospel that Paul is preaching, I want you to know that this is a gospel that has always been agreed upon, my friends. Always been agreed upon. And that is one of the reasons, as Christians today, we have to listen to this gospel. This is the gospel that Paul preached. It's the gospel the apostles preached. It's the gospel Jesus preached. It's the gospel the Old Testament preached. It's the gospel that is preached to us today. Let me very quickly show you a little bit of this in the Bible. Genesis chapter 15, we don't think much of the Old Testament preaching the gospel, but it certainly did. Abraham is there in Genesis 15, and what happens? Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, this is what the Lord tells Abraham. Let me preface it by saying this to you this morning. The main point that Paul is talking about when he talks about the gospel, the main thing he's getting at is this. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is by grace, through faith, not by works. That's the main thing he's looking at. When the Bible speaks of, about faith alone, it always includes repentance. It's like the same side. It's like two sides of the same coin. But listen to what he says. God says to Abraham in Genesis 15, 6, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. You see, we'll be looking at this, God willing, much more in the future. But here, what you need to see is, God doesn't count you as saved because you do good things in your life. God doesn't count you as saved because you've kept yourself away from certain sins or you've done things as a young person. God counts you saved based on Jesus and simple faith in Him. He declares you to be right with Him. This is the gospel that Jesus preached. Listen to Luke 8. Luke 8, verse 12. This is Jesus. He's, exp he's explaining the parable of the sower. He says, Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. How can you be saved, Jesus says. It's by believing. By believing. This is the gospel that John preached. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Now, we're going to, I hope, look a lot more at the actual gospel. Paul is really, he's touched on it. He's not got into the actual message yet in Galatians. He's setting up his argument. But I would just say to you here today, is this, un, is this your understanding of the gospel? It's not based on what we do. And don't mishear me. If we believe the gospel, we have our life changes dramatically. But that happens after we accept the gospel. It's not based on the way you grew up. It's not based on the way you're living right now as far as coming into a relationship with God. It's not based on whether you keep yourself from this or you have this tradition or you have this in your life or, or you've never sinned in this way and you're not one of those bad people who were on drugs. And it's not based on any of that. You see, there's a lot of people who vote, quote-unquote, the right way and they say the right things, and they're against abortion, and, uh, and they would never ever do even play certain games that people have played. They would never even dream about taking drugs or getting drunk. They would never dream about those things, and they're going to be in hell when they die because they're trusting themselves to save them. There's plenty of people today who've never smoked, they've never drank, 
and uh, they, they dress up very nicely, and they treat people with kindness. Nothing wrong with that. But there's many people like that who aren't going to be in heaven. The Pharisees were like that. So have we seen this gospel that Paul is preaching about? Have we seen this gospel preached in the Old Testament, preached by Jesus, preached by the Apostle John here? It's not based on what we have or have not done that we're saved. It's based on the grace of God given to us. We believe in Him. We believe in Jesus. And He saves us. And He changes us. This is the gospel that Peter preached. Acts chapter 10. Verse 43, what's Peter say? Of Him all the prophets bear witness that through His name everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins. Is that the gospel we believe in? Is that the gospel we trust in? I'm not trusting that I'm a preacher. I'm not trusting that uh, I'm tr- we're trying to raise our kids right. I'm not trusting that I try not to curse. I'm not trusting in these things, though these things are good. I'm trusting in the fact that Jesus died for me. He's my Savior. And the grace of God has, has given me faith that I can believe and trust Him. That's, that's my hope in. I'm not trusting that I've, that I've been a good boy or girl. I'm not trusting that, that when I was little, I did things better at school or at home than other people did. I'm not trusting in those things. Because to trust in those things is actually to reject Jesus. If I trust in these things, what I'm saying is, Jesus, I don't need you because I got these things. Or we're saying, Jesus, I'm so thankful you died for me, but just wait a minute because I've got to have these things too. What you did wasn't good enough for me. I need some other things too to save me. It's a rejection of the gospel. What we have to do is come to God so humbly, and we say, Lord God, there's no way I can save myself. There's nothing I can do. I'm I'm a sinner just like everybody else. It's to say to Him, when you remember the parable of the prodigal son, most of us think of the prodigal son, don't we? We think of the prodigal son, this evil man. Look at that. Basically, he spit in his father's face. He he took his inheritance early. He went to the far country. He wasted his money on prostitutes. He wasted his money on on loose living. He found out himself working with pigs. Remember, he was a Jew. That was disgusting. He even wanted to eat the food the pigs had. You say, what a sinner. And then finally this man comes back to his father. And what happens? There's an older brother at the house. And the older brother sticks his nose up and says, why are you... Why is this guy back home? He's a sinner. I've never disobeyed my father. I've been a good boy my whole life. I've never drank. I've never done anything. I've always obeyed my father perfectly. And now this sinner comes in and he's going to have the calf killed. He's going to have the party. Boy, why can't I have those things? I've never sinned before, basically is what he said. And that man's more lost than his brother. In one sense, that's the point of the story. You had this nice little church boy, this nice little choir boy who always obeyed his father, who always did what was right and had no love in his heart and no mercy and no trust in God. So is our trust in us is what Paul's getting at or is our trust in Jesus Christ? This is the gospel that James preached. You look in Acts chapter 15, what do you find? you find that at the Jerusalem council, the decisions they made, James agreed with it. And then finally, it's the gospel preached at the last invitation in God's Word. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Are you thirsty this morning? Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. You say, but I've got to do something. I can't just simply go and get saved. I can't just simply come to Jesus. I've got to do something. 
You see, when I, when I get my life straight, I'll come back and I'll get saved. When I, when I take care of some business, you know, everything in my life's not, not what I want it to be. But when I get things straightened out, I, I tell you, I, I'm going to come get saved. I want to. Just give me a little more time. The Bible says come without money. See, what we see here is this. Listen, I, I've been a Christian for a number of years and still this kind of strikes at me. It's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's not about how good I've been. Now listen, I want everybody to be quote-unquote good. <laughs> but if we're trusting in our goodness to make us right with God, we are going to be badly mistaken one day. Isn't the Gospel wonderful? You take all your sins that you've ever committed and all you have to do is acknowledge Him before God and believe in His Son. And Jesus Christ forgives you of every sin and gives you His Spirit and makes you a new person. You know, maybe the hardest thing for some people is just simply to admit, to admit that to God. John chapter 3. Maybe this describes you this morning. I don't know. Starting in verse 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Now here's verse 20. This is really what I'm talking about. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. They don't want their deeds exposed. When we come to God, we just have to acknowledge our failures, our sins, don't we? I've not been the person everybody thought I was. I've not been the person that even I thought I was. I'm a sinner just like everyone else. I've got to admit that. I've got to come to God. It's going to expose myself to God. It's going to be painful. My heart's going to be broken. But broken hearts are the only hearts that God mends and God fixes. This is the Gospel that has always been preached in the church of Jesus Christ. That's the reason we must believe it. That's the reason we must share it with our loved ones, our families. Is because we want people to be saved. It is the Gospel. If you've been a Christian for a number of years, take heart. It's the Gospel that saved the people in the past. Maybe you've had family that went on to be with the Lord. It's the same Gospel that saved them. It's the same Gospel that saved Paul. It's the same Gospel that saved Abraham. You are in the Gospel way. It will save you if you stay with it. And if you're new to the faith, if you're a new Christian, take heart. Sometimes life feels so heavy. Sometimes life feels so hard and you have these struggles and you have these, in one sense, new temptations happening in, in the world and life is just difficult. Take heart. It's the same Gospel that got your forefathers and foremothers through difficult times. It's the same Gospel that got Paul through st being stoned, being shipwrecked, being beaten. It's the same Gospel that helped every Christian forever go to their final place. And it's the same Gospel that will get us to our resting place if we hold to it. May God help each and every one of us.